Welcome, friends. Uh, I'm delighted to see everyone once again, and especially after our week off. I did want to share a little story what Ileana and I were doing last week when we <clears throat> couldn't have the call. Um, we had the wonderful experience. Uh, we have some old business friends, people who originally I met when they were clients at Duracell, the battery company. And we've been friends for over three decades. Uh, and there were a number of couples that we get together every once in a while. And this time uh, we rented a house, a big house together on the coast, a place called Johns Island in Kiowa, South Carolina. And I have to tell you, this was um, really exciting for a couple of reasons. And it's actually related to, to Deutsch Kidder Sensei's talk today, because he's gonna be talking about in the working world, leading from the heart. And this is really, uh, I think, the, these other couples that have been uh, friends of mine and clients of mine, where we experienced, you know, when you, when you focus on quality of life at work and you put people first, treat everyone with dignity and respect, clearly make them an owner of the process and the business, as we did at Duracell, Gillette, um, Owens Corning, and Synthetic Industries. Those those four clients that went on for like, you know, over two decades, these other couples were a part of that whole transformation process. And to be able to kind of experience, you know, their financial success, but more importantly, the quality of life of people at work and to be able to celebrate that just again and again with lifetime friends, it's just so enjoyable. Um, and I, I was, I just thought it was serendipitous that, uh, Matt is going to talk about these same principles that I think we always emphasize in these uh, corporate transformations. Um, I wanted to say another thing. Uh, in exercise 12, in living with the wind at your back, I talk about being in and with nature, living in and with nature, experiencing nature deeply. And I, in some exercises there, a way to experience nature where, where it's obvious you feel the flow and flux of, of the universe would be in the morning earth turn, sunrise, and the evening earth turn, sunset, because it's just so obvious. I mean, everything, the light, the sounds, the animals, they're changing uh, during those critical periods. Well, we were living on a, I'd never done this before, but we were living on a tidewater marsh with a long pier that went way over the marsh up to a place called the Kiowa River, which was brackish water, half salt, half, half uh, fresh water. And I've never experienced it before, but it was 13 feet from low tide to high tide. Every day, the swing would be 13 feet of ocean water, and the world would just change around you. It was so obvious. It was like the ocean, the earth was breathing, you know, in and out. <laughs> in, back to the ocean, and then out. The tidal waters would fill up. And, and when there was low tide, all it was was mud and, and beds of mussels coming up. And because the mud was exposed to the air, if you've ever been around a marsh, the smell is not so great. Apparently it releases sulfur. So it's kind of like going by a paper factory. So the smell isn't that good, but as soon as the water comes in, the smell is gone because it's covered up. And as the water is really low, we saw stingrays in super shallow water coming in. And then the, the water would get more, and believe it or not, you'd get a freshwater fish, a trout, then a shark, then a sea turtle, <laughs> then bald-headed eagles, um, um, uh, egrets, all different kinds of egrets and herons. And it's just teeming with life up and down. It's like a constant you know, earth turns sunrise, sunset, but it's got all this breathing going on. Anyway, I just wanted to say that it was a, a, a wonderful week. If you ever get a chance to experience that kind of ecology, you talk about the key of the universe and the dynamism of the key of the universe is just obvious and just fills your senses with uh, wonder. Okay, well, with that little uh, shared uh, tidbit, um, I'd like to introduce our presenter today, uh, my friend, uh, Matt Deutsch Kidder Sensei. He is a Chu Den in Shinshin Totsudo and Yondan in Shinshin Totsudo Aikido. He's a full key lecturer 
and an authorized assistant examiner, as he is the head instructor of Reston Ki Aikido in Reston, Virginia. Let me speak about his Aikido history a little bit. Uh, Matt began training Ki Aikido in 1999 at the Virginia Ki Society under George Simcox Sensei. He's traveled to Japan uh, several times for intensive training uh, with me and often as Otomo, also in Russia multiple times. Um, in 2004, at the International Taiki Competition in Japan, <clears throat> he and his partner, John Papali Sensei from Minnesota, were awarded two gold medals and one bronze medal. Matt began teaching adult and children's classes in 2004, and he's led outreach programs at local high schools and juvenile detention centers. A bit of his work history briefly. Matt began working as a software developer in the games industry in 1997 at a small company then known as Interworld Productions. Uh, Matt continued to work there over the next 17 years where the company changed its name to Mythic Entertainment and was later purchased by Electronic Arts. I'm not a gamer, but I think I know enough about gaming where Mythic Entertainment and Electronic Arts are really big names for those familiar with that industry. For almost 20 years in the video uh, game industry, or after 20 years, he joined a small cloud computing startup founded by the Mythic alumni uh, leading the software development team. Later, where he is in his current job, he joined uh, Capital One Financial as a senior manager where he currently leads a team of software developers. The title of uh, Deutsch Kidder Sensei's talk today is Leading with Heart, Applying Key Principles to People Leadership, and as opposed to Technical Leadership. So in this presentation, Matt will share why he started training Ki Aikido and how he's applied the lessons he's learned through that training to his work as a people leader. And with that, I will mute myself and turn it over to Deutsch Kidder Sensei. Thank you, Sensei. So I'm going to uh, share my screen and I'm going to be going back and forth between showing my screen and um, not, uh, so that you know, most of my slides are very evocative, um, but we don't necessarily need to keep them up the whole time. So yeah, so I'm talking about leading with heart and how I apply key principles in my daily job, uh, which really does like come from uh, my heart, I think. Uh, so the overall agenda that we're going to work through is I'll talk about a little bit about my journey, how I came to Aikido, why I started training Aikido, and then really go through some detailed uh, explanation of how I have come to apply these principles uh, in my daily life at work, and how really, I think just being soaked in these principles in this training has impacted uh, my ability to do my job. So, uh, up front, I'll say, you know, a lot of this is not premeditated. I did not go in saying, how can I apply this to my work life? It's more upon reflection going through all of these uh, wonderful sharings that other people have had that I've come to realize I'm applying all of these things in various different ways. And then we'll do a little bit of. This. I journey through uh, to Aikido. So as a, as a kid, I played a lot of video games on my uh, older brother's Atari 2600. Uh, and eventually we got a, a computer for home, an Atari 800 XL, that's the king thing on the side. Uh, and that's programming and software development program in of that. And, um, I was very young. I was five or six, so I didn't really have the patience to type things out, but my older sister did. It helped her with her typing practice, and so got some games there. Um, and then later, working with computer games brings me to the uh, box on in the middle left, which is a modem, for those of you who remember dial-up internet days, and I would play video games uh, and play the local dial-up uh, game. 
uh, that was developed by some people. And eventually those people formed Mythic Entertainment. Uh, and that's where I was working through college. And one of the folks there, who some of you might remember from um, VKS history, uh, Matt Fyror, uh, worked at Mythic Entertainment with me and he talked about Aikido training. And I was like, I'm a, I'm a software developer. I sit in a chair all day. I need some kind of exercise to, uh, to move around. And so that's how I came to Aikido, particularly with uh, George and Tuck Sensei, as pictured here. Uh, and really, I just wanted to start off where for physical activity and having fun um, moving my body and not sitting in a chair all day. So now coming to how I'm really applying this, uh, have come to apply these things in my daily life. So uh, we always start with the motto in everything. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, read that for us particularly. So let us have a universal mind that loves and protects all creation and helps all things grow and develop. To unify mind and body and become one with the universe is the ultimate purpose of our study. So we all know the motto and we know the rest of it, uh, four basic principles. Um, but what I really wanna highlight here, um, for me, I've come to realize over time is actually a slight change to the specific wording there. I really like to think of it as we have a universal mind that loves and protects uh, all creation and helps all things grow and develop. And to experience the natural unity of mind and body and realize our connection with nature continuously is the ultimate purpose of our study. And I think that is not just for us. A lot of this that I'm kind of come through is how we apply this with others as well. Um, I also want to highlight that it's about loving and protecting all creation. So we have a care for, for ourselves, we have a care for those around us. Um, and you know, having that care for the people that we work with, the people that report to us um, is really powerful and shows them that you know, we have their backs, that they can be open. We can be open and vulnerable with them and they can be open and vulnerable with us, which then allows them to perform and to take risks and to do all kinds of um, powerful, great things. Also in the motto embedded right there is growing and developing. Um, so it's really how do we grow and develop ourselves? How do we grow and develop our team? So that's kind of, that's one foundational element that I have. Uh, the next foundational element is the value of our existence. again, I will read. Our lives are born of the key of the universe. Let us give thanks for being born not as plants and animals, but as human beings blessed with a universal mind. Let us pledge to fulfill our missions by helping to guide the development and creation of the universe. So as a leader, uh, I set the standard for the team. I uh, my actions and words and thoughts every day are guiding and creating the universe of work for myself, for my team, for the people around us. And their actions in turn have that same impact for themselves. They are continuously creating and guiding the creation of the universe for themselves, for their teams, for their families, for their roommates, for whatever the situation is. And then collectively, we're doing that as a company. We are uh, constantly creating and developing and guiding the creation of that work universe. You know, the culture of work is the things that we do in every moment and the choices that we're making about what we're valuing and what we want to do. So that's the second uh, of our uh, four foundations. We'll have two more. So the next one is the way to union with key. So let me again share my screen for that one. 
And again, I'm going to read this one. So the absolute universe is one. We call this key. Our lives and our bodies are born of the key of the universe. We study thoroughly the principles of the universe and practice them. We are one with the universe. There is no need to despond, no need to fear. The way we follow is the way of the universe, which no difficulty nor hardship can hinder. Let us have the courage to say, if I have a clear conscience and a calm spirit, I dare to face courageously any obstacle I may encounter. So the thing I really wanna highlight here that is, affects me in my, um, kind of in my work is this um, concept that like, our lives are born of the key of the universe. There is no need to despond, no need to fear. So to say, I am uh, good enough as I am. And so are all the people around me. We are all good and worthy and should be there and can grow and we can develop. So we can then take on these challenging um, things in front of us. Uh, you know, working with our customers uh, can be very challenging. Uh, working within the team can be challenging. Uh, you know, quarterly objectives, all of these things that we work together with. So having this as a foundation is really helpful. And then the final foundation, which is very predictable at this point is unification of mind and body. So mind and body were originally one. Do not think that the power you have is only the power you ordinarily use and moan that you have little strength. The power you ordinarily use is like the small visible segment of an iceberg. When we unify our mind and body and become one with the universe, we can use the great power that is naturally ours. So again, this applies to me as an individual associate as an individual leader, but it also is <clears throat> something for me to work with my team on and to help them be able to really work together and work in a coordinated and calm way so that they can access all of that power that is naturally theirs. So this all forms the you know, foundation of where I'm coming from for this. Uh, so to summarize that briefly. So we are born of the key of the universe. We are worthy, we are enough, we are resilient, and we are powerful. So we have the power and the responsibility to shape the world around us, to shape our culture, to shape our world environment, our work environment, our life, and we can change. So it's really important there that we, we have this growth mindset that people can grow and they can develop. Uh, they're not uh, completely defined by what they did today or what they did yesterday or what they did last week or what they didn't do or what I didn't do in those times. They can be defined by what they are able to do and how they are able to grow and develop. And then the final thing I really um, wanna highlight here is um, how, like how Intoku applies here. So, you know, just as the number one can never be reduced to zero, once we act or speak, our action or speech is never completely erased. An old oriental saying tells us, so good and the harvest will be good, so evil and reap evil. We must understand that everything we do comes back to ourselves. Therefore, before wishing for our own happiness and welfare and that of our children, we must do good in secret. To do good in secret means to act without seeking attention and praise, to act without any hope of reward. This is called intoku. Among the various ways of performing intoku, to walk the way of the universe and lead others along this way is best. So the way I apply that to like my business life is, it's not about me, it's about them. I am there to support them, to my team. You know, my team reports to me, but and I work for them. So, and I try to instill that in them as well. So it's not about how do I get the next promotion? How do I, you know, get the next raise? How do I do this? It's like, let's figure out how we can serve our customers more effectively, how we can be of service to each other and um, perform well from that place. 
Uh, and it also allows us to give risk. One of the things I'm not, I don't think we talked a lot about within Toku is that we're, we're not seeking praise, we're not seeking any reward, but it means we're not doing it for those reasons. We're doing it, we're not doing it for the reward. We're doing it for the goodness of doing it, for the value to creating that universe, to each other, to supporting, to like, it's not just about, I'm gonna do this in order to get that. So that's all um, kind of the foundation. Now, as a team, we often end up in a very chaotic kind of situation. <clears throat> You know, people are working in different directions. People are maybe most everyone's trying to go in the right way, but some people are still um, on the ground. Uh, so kind of a reflection of this. So lots of scattered attention. Um, you know, I think this reminds us of a particular level of body-mind awareness, um, that things are going all kinds of different places. So, <clears throat> uh, I can act as an otomo for my team uh, by helping to uh, guide them and to support them in getting to an alignment uh, and moving all in the same direction. And then, you know, also work with that with the folks around me. And I do that by starting off with keeping one point. So uh, staying calm, staying relaxed in challenging situations, um, in challenging one-on-one -on -one conversations with associates. Sometimes we have to have difficult performance conversations with um, somebody who's working for us. And we have to, you know, if my energy is up and I'm all worked up about this, that does not help the associate have um, the best experience out of this. Uh, it's gonna be a hard time, but I can still keep one point and work with this. And this is you know, also coming into the unity of calm and action, where you know, we talk about like the eye of the typhoon, which is always peaceful. Inner calm results in great strength of action. Calm and action are exactly one. So keep a calm mind and you'll be able to perform to the best of your ability, even in an emergency or in facing important tasks. So we have lots of different, competing priorities. We also have, you know, <clears throat> I've gone through uh, corporate restructurings, reorgs, uh, and that's a very chaotic kind of situation. And staying calm is very helpful there. There's all kinds of things we have to do, all kinds of competing priorities. We can stay calm and relaxed. We can be more effective as we go through and prioritize those things and execute on them. So then we have, uh, relaxation uh, and kind of working with stress. So I'll read that one. So we are accustomed to having trouble with unnecessary nervousness. Nervousness causes blood vessels to contract, making it difficult for the impurities to leave the body and this makes one susceptible to many diseases. Relaxation is truly an elixir of life. So in a work situation, we spend a lot of time there. We have a lot of our stress is coming around uh, work and you know trying to deliver different things do different things and that can be you know really challenging so helping if i stay calm and relaxed helping other people be relaxed kind of dropping the storylines around um, how good we are how bad we are who's you know, this is the good guy this is the bad guy um, just helping the teammate and helping the team do the same giving people the benefit of the doubt and assuming a positive intent for people are kind of particular ways that really helps do that. There's a lot where we, you know, we get uptight, we get tense because we're telling ourselves, this is what's happening, even though we don't have sufficient or full information about what's going on and kind of relaxing, letting go of that and moving forward and demonstrating that uh, behavior as a leader really helps the team um, it helps those around us to be able to continue to move through our day uh, effectively and in a positive way. And then we have living calmness. So 
So in a natural state, the weight of objects is always underside. Therefore, the physical expression of living calmness is that the weight of every part of our body is also underside. Like the calm, still surface of the water that reflects the moon and the flying bird. True living calmness is the condition of our mind that reflects all things clearly. This is our original and natural state. By understanding these principles, we can acquire true living calmness. So the way I work with this is it's about that um, condition of our mind that reflects all things clearly. So having that living calmness, that deep calmness, we can start to see things as they really are. We can see things more clearly. Uh, it's like Shannon Sensei, Toei Sensei asked us to learn by seeing, watch, learn by watching. So we can really, you know, look and see um, and feel like, okay, this person is really agitated. This person is looking this, like looking this way. What's going on? And then, you know, work with that. Um, it also to me is about uh, only acting when necessary. So I don't know, I don't have all of the information um, and maybe I can be a little bit patient and wait for those waves to calm down and learn things from that, but also have the humility to understand that maybe I do need to go out and figure out more about the situation, understand more about what's going on. And then finally, we have connection. So it's really important in my mind as we, like we're all working together. None of us are completely siloed as individuals, so we all are connected. Uh, so this is key extension, extending key. We are connecting with each other. We are connecting with the team uh, internally. We are connecting with those around us. And particularly in a corporate environment, a lot of this is about how do we communicate effectively with those around us and um, outside of that and applying that, realizing that my actions, the actions of my team don't happen in a vacuum. They happen, they have impacts, they have influences downstream. I have dependencies upstream for me. I need to communicate with them. I need to understand more of what's going on. Any disturbance around any of those things um, can be problematic. Uh, so then I like to think, okay, so now I'm going to apply more of the you know, five principles to lead others uh, in particular. As you may have noticed, I just went over four basic principles but, uh, and their applications. So now it's how am I applying the five principles to lead others? And the first one, well, we've kind of gone over the key extension, key is extending. So next is know your partner's mind, which for me is about curiosity, kind of like a cat. So we want to really, um, as I'm working with my team and understanding what's going on, or as I'm working with uh, my customer, my product owner, I really want to understand where are they coming from? Uh, what's going on? So asking really good questions, listening really well, um, trying to really understand what's going on for them, what's important to them, and being curious. And I think especially in those regular one-on-one -on -one conversations that I have with the associates that report to me, the associates I work for, it's about, it reminds me a lot of key testing of that I have to be more calm than the other person so that I can see the state of their mind. I can see what's really going on. You know, someone can come in and be like, I'm fine, everything's good, whatever, like I'm fine. And seeing that and just like recognizing, hey, um, let's, Maybe we need to talk more about this. Um, like it seems like you're maybe something's bugging you, or you know, being in that meeting, um, you know, with the team or with a larger group, and you're realizing this person looks like they want to say something, but maybe they're a junior member of the team, uh, uh, or you know, maybe they're you know a woman or something where they're they're not feeling empowered to speak. So it's kind of understanding that, seeing that, so that you can give them those opportunities to, to do that and see what's going on. Next we have um, respect. So right, the next one is respect your partner's key. So respecting your partner's key. It's very hard to make someone else do something. 
even in a corporate environment where I hold like an ultimate violence of, uh, you know, like your job is at risk. It's, you know, especially for me in the work that I've been doing, I work with highly trained professionals with years and years of experience and training to do what they're doing. You know, these are people who are working on complex software development systems, integrating multiple things together. I don't have all the perfect knowledge of every piece of those systems, so I really have to trust them and really respect people and see them as they are, which again is a connection to the treasure of key testing and helping them to understand where they actually really are um, in that, you know, performance perspective as well. You know, those performance conversations around really saying, okay, like, I respect you as a person as you are, that foundational element of, you know, you are good and worthy and strong and you need to improve your performance in these ways or we need to, you know, change things around these ways. Um, so respecting them, understanding them, seeing them as they are. And then we take the place of our partner. Uh, so we really feel and experience, you know, with our hearts, leading from heart, leading from, you know, kokoro, that uh, feel it as much as we possible, what they're really going through. Uh, have the empathy with, with them, you know, understand more and more deeply, take their place, look at things from their point of view, what needs to be true, like why, what needs to be true for them to be feeling this way or for them to want this particular piece of functionality. And that helps also when we realize, you know, a customer uh, often comes to us and says, I want, I want to do this. Like, and there's, they say like, this is what I want to do. And, and when you really have that curiosity, work with them more closely, respect where they're coming from, take their place, you realize, actually what they want to do is something else they just think this is the way they have to do it within the system that we've built and we can understand and grow from that and and you know actually implement the thing that's useful uh, but it's also when i'm doing people leadership when i'm leading a team it's about not asking them to do things that i'm not willing to do so not asking them to take on the call shifts and stay up all night to do releases and things if i'm not willing to do that so you know, I go out there and I'll be on the call uh, overnight. If there's a major impact to the system, even though, even if I'm not necessarily needed to do the technical work, I'm there to support them. I'm um, getting on that call when things are down at two in the morning, really understanding and being there with them. And that finally kind of comes to confidence. So building that space of uh, trust within the team, of respect, uh, of empathy, allows the team to really perform with confidence, to work well together, to trust each other that they, we have each other's back. We, um, we're aligned, we can move together, we're all operating towards the same goal. So nobody is having to um, look behind them, look to the side, kind of hold anything back. They're able to give 100%. 100% consistently every day, all the time, every movement, just like Sokshinogyo. So, Misogi, like just 100%, building that environment, building that culture that enables that can perform with confidence. And then finally, we're aligned, we're in harmony. And kind of operating in this way, I think we start to be able to really think about. Uh, the Shodan criteria in relationship to how uh, the team works. So the the posture, the shise, how, like are people in the right places? Are we um, people doing the right work for that particular person? Uh, the shise, the like eye line, are we looking at the right things? Are we aligned in the right direction? Maybe we're all working together and we're aligned together, but we're going the wrong direction. So we need to understand very clearly what that is. And then the ma'ai, the, the betweenness, the, um, the space around us, the space that we're in um, you know, physically when we're in the office, the space that we're in virtually when we're work from home, the work space, the like particular technology space that we're in, the, our relationship to teams, 
um, how all of that works together, the right spacing so that we're not stomping on top of other people's work or we can work together as opposed to next to each other. So that's kind of the overview of how I apply <clears throat> key principles in my daily life as a manager of software development. So we went over kind of an introduction of how I came to Aikido um, through video games. Uh, a friend there at work was training. I went to train um, as well, and I fell in love with the training. And then kind of how I've applied four basic principles, um, four, five principles to lead others, and really that foundational element to me of um, the first four shokushu and how that really informs my entire approach around, you know, we can grow and develop. It's about loving and protecting the people around us and ourselves. It's everybody has value. Everybody's life comes from the key of the universe and is valuable and useful and uh, not even useful, just like they're valuable just in and of themselves. And we all create this universe around us and have this deep power that is available to us. And how can I, as a leader, empower the people around me, the teams that work with me, to you know, really achieve that and experience that for themselves? So I hope that's been helpful. Uh, that is uh, that is my presentation. That is my sharing. So thank you, uh, Sensei, for the opportunity to do that. Thank you, Matt. That was excellent. And um, wow, what beautiful pictures you selected. The <laughs> pictures are all um, Creative Commons um, free commercial use. Uh, it, well, it was interesting to look around as soon as you put up the first cat. You know, I, it, it, it's like, it's not fair when you use animal pictures, right? Everyone smiles. Oh, look at the kitty. You know? <laughs> Anyway, it was it was it was beautiful and a, a wonderful, um, heartfelt message as well. I'm going to open it up for questions uh, for you, but I I would like you to comment. Um, maybe I'm mistaken, but I thought you also. I was going to ask you about. Um, I think with your team, you've actually shared like the four basic principles, <clears throat> and I know, or I think I remember that you were also. For a while there, maybe it's still going on, but you had like a weekly meditation session um, that you were leading for the whole company uh, where they were giving you an opportunity to um, stretch. Uh, could you share something about that? I thought that was really innovative too, that I think it was part of your performance management system where they were encouraging you to bring to work outside interests or something like that. To, to me, that's really attending to the whole person. That's, that's about putting quality of life first at work. Uh, yeah. Could you say a few things about that? Yeah, so I have not um, formally like talked about four basic principles within the team. Um, okay. I try to do it more, uh, more from that, um, I think, Setsudo sense of just demonstrating and helping other people uh, in more subtle ways uh, or different ways to kind of realize these things. Mm -hmm. Um, and yes, I do, I lead a um, mindful Monday thing every, so every Monday at 12, 15, uh, I lead a, um, within my division, so about 200 people or something like that. Um, I lead a, just a basic mindfulness meditation practice for about 20 minutes. Uh, and that came out of kind of doing leadership training here at Capital One, and they were really encouraging us um, to to bring our whole selves to work, but also it's about bringing, helping our associates bring their whole self to work, right? And that's that, like leading with heart is the whole person is there uh, as much as possible. So there's not this sense of like, oh, I, I compartmentalize and I'm just here doing this thing and then I check in, check out and, but, um, or I, or being afraid to be yourself at work, um, it's like, you know, looking over your shoulder, looking at like watching your back all the time, but being calm and relaxed as part of that. And then I do also lead uh, company-wide uh, mindfulness trainings as well. Uh, so there's, <clears throat> um, there it's open across the company and it's an open enrollment uh, 
program that they have internally uh, to do that. And I've done it for leadership groups and um, new associates and you know, lots of different organizations. And, and just out of, just to follow up, with the Mindful Monday now, is this continuing virtually then where you can still get together at 1215 on Mondays? Yeah, so every Monday, 1215, um, I get on a Zoom call. I put on some nice kind of relaxing Zoom <laughs> background. Uh, and lately, I've actually been introducing um, some of the phrases, some of the epitaphs from Saikonton as contemplations oh. through that. Nice. Well. Particularly the, um, the wind through the bamboo. Yeah, yeah. It's beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, love affair with a book. <laughs> Strange. Well, um, what what kind of questions does anyone have for uh, Deutsch Kidder Sensei? Hey, Matt, I'm curious. Um, the feedback that you've received from senior management, how have they taken your your principles, the foundation that you're creating? Have they have they helped support you? Have they embraced it themselves? Have they considered it a best practice that gets extended across other departments? I'm kind of curious if you've created a wave that has really um, you know, taken, taken effect across the entire company. So I don't think I can take credit for that. Um, I think to some extent uh, right now it's a fairly localized thing. I was trying to you know, build that up more, but when we started working from home, it becomes somewhat more challenging in those ways. Um, and there, I was very fortunate that there was already a, kind of a mindfulness movement going on within the company overall that I was able to um, hook into very quickly once I joined the company and start offering more of these things. Um, so I think it is, it is growing, it is developing, uh, but I personally can't take credit for most of that. You should. Hey, hey, Matt, when you say, you know, kind of mindfulness in the company, um, just to put a, a label on it to help me, is this basically CBT, like cognitive behavioral therapy? Or So usually what we do is various meditation techniques. So um, I'll usually introduce just a basic breathing uh, meditation, breathing awareness meditation, and then build that up to key breathing, essentially. Okay. Uh, and then also we'll do some body scan meditations, some gratitude meditation, some uh, walking meditation when we were in person. Uh, and then we go over some of the um, basic neuroscience behind what's going on. And, the, you know, the, we talk about the amygdala and amygdala hijack and flight and fright response and how mindfulness and meditation practice help to, you know, calm those responses. Uh, how that benefits us in a you know corporate environment, how it benefits us in a personal environment. Um, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and those are half day um, seminar or workshops, so three hours. Great, great. Any other questions uh, about applications as a manager, as a leader? Anything? I don't have a question. I just want to say that I think. The presentation has been fantastic, and Matt is an incredible human being. I, I, um, I just hear everything he's saying, and I, I love it. He's talking about loving the people. I love him. I absolutely <laughs> love this guy, Matt Deutsch Kidder. Thank you very much, Matt. Oh, very kind. We, Thank you. We got to end there. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Kirsten, I think you, you had your hand up. I did. Hey, Sensei, hope you're doing well. Um, so my question pivots more around um, application of these principles in the broader culture of the organization that you're in. So I'm curious, um, in the previous organizations you were in, did you find it, e like, what conditions presented that made it easier or more challenging to apply these principles? and to help them take hold, either in your team or more broadly? So in, I think in my previous positions, it was um, in some ways more difficult to, to bring this in explicitly. Um, and 
I still tried, I think I was still doing my best to uh, exemplify the principles and to just like live my life that way. I also wasn't thinking of it particularly as a way of bringing it to the company. Uh, but one of the things that you know, Capital One has been very, has helped me with, and is I think one of the great things, this is not an advertisement for Capital One, but um, is that we really do value our associates, that it's about um, building teams that are diverse and inclusive, that are empowered, um, and that are inspired to do great work every day, bringing great people in. And so there, there's just a general openness to trying different ways of making that happen um, and really caring for each other. Does that answer the question, Kristen? Kristen? It does. Thank you, Sensei. I have a question too. What was your biggest challenge doing your way? Uh, during my work? Yeah. Is that, yeah. Um, to be honest, the biggest challenge as a people leader is when I've had to let people go. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, trying you know, my best to remain calm uh, in that situation. Um, you know, having the empathy of understanding having been let go myself in the past and what it feels like on that side. Um, is, I mean, those are the hardest conversations and hardest things for me as a leader. And what was your biggest challenge in Aikido? Uh, I think my, my biggest challenge in Aikido is getting over what other people think of me and what other and trying to look good. <laughs> I think that's my biggest challenge in Aikido. Mm. And I see Sensei laughing and nodding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I, uh, no, John, I, I don't think that's quite it. I, I, like John said, uh, putting up with his uke. So, <laughs> um, I think for many people, or at least my experience has been, some of the most difficult conversations, work-related conversations. Of course, letting someone go is the ex is is the extreme. But all of the performance management meetings that lead up to that, where you're trying to, you know, praise the good and and then bring up what maybe needs work you know, quote unquote, mm -hmm. needs work or what excels, having those conversations where everyone knows they're being evaluated and it, it counts, it, it, it affects career and money. Those, those are where, you, where these principles really, really help uh, to, to have those empathetic conversations. And I think Matt is really, really good at it. I've talked to him about his work ever since I knew him. Um, and, in, and I will say again, in the gaming industry, he's a dude, you know, he was like one of the very first hires, like under 10, I think, with the company that, 11. Became, uh, 11, <laughs> that became Mythic Entertainments uh, and then was, was purchased. So when it, when it came to gaming, he, that, that's where he, he grew his, um, uh, his experience. Um, and now he's doing it in the financial world. So I, I just have followed his career as long as I've known him. And it's, it's just a wonderful thing to, to watch him blossom at work and in Aikido. And um, he's grown tremendously. He's, he's an excellent Otomo. He's very good at doing things invisibly and not having to be asked. And uh, heck, he'll watch my eyes and he'll know I need a whiteboard and boom, the whiteboard appears with markers and erasers. It's like, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> So he's, he's, he really pays attention without staring or making anyone uncomfortable. So uh, for many years of that kind of training, uh, Matt, let me just say publicly, thank you very much. And, and it's been a pleasure to work with you all these years. Thank you. So Rich, um, shall I tee up next week?
I think you should tee up next week, Sensei. <laughs> okay. That was a great session, Poppy Father. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you all, and thank you for your questions. Um, okay, very exciting. Um, next week, our presenter will be Kirsten Welge Sensei, whose picture on my screen is right below my own. She is the assistant head instructor of Minnesota Ki Aikido and the Center for Mind Body Oneness. The title of her talk will be From Frozen to Flow Shifting the Subconscious Through Setsudo. I'm going to say that again because that'll, you want to think about that. From Frozen to Flow Shifting the Subconscious Through Setsudo. The description of Welge Sensei's talk is follows. Um, she will be discussing her Ki Aikido life transformation journey, starting with the significant personal impact of Shokushu number 21, Setsudo, then learning and experiencing the five principles of teaching, which she'll cover, Joy Sensei's five principles of teaching, and finally applying the same in her daily life. Specifically, Welge Sensei will share examples of how her training has produced the daily life benefits of greater openness, resilience, and capacity to support others in her family, communities, and workplace. So we're gonna get a real exciting dose of key and daily life. I've seen um, Welge Sensei's um, outline, detailed outline, and I promise you it's going to be extremely personally authentic and sincere. And the life change that she uh, describes in this transformation process is, is really wonderful and it's ongoing. And I couldn't be more pleased that she will be our presenter next Thursday. Uh, Welge Sensei, do you have any comment to, to tee this up or did I, did I make any errors on your description? Possibly follow that, Sensei. Yeah, it was beautiful. Thank you. Okay, well, we, we look forward to hearing from you uh, next week. Any final comments from anybody? Well, once again, um, thank you for your kind comments. Uh, thank you for your questions. Um, Bob, thank you very much for loving all over Deutsch Kidder Sensei. <laughs> he, he, he really is a good man. He is a good man. All right, everyone, I'll see you next week. Uh, I love you. Aloha. Arigato gozaimashita. <laughs>